nine minutes over time, so let's go ahead and get started with the um, session on Huntington's disease. It is my uh, great pleasure to get to moderate and introduce this session, and I'll just uh, show a few slides of my own. I'm Jan Nolta. I work at the University of California Davis Medical Center in Sacramento, and I love working there largely because we work with uh, the most amazing people at the Huntington's Disease Center of Excellence. This is our clinical team and Dr. Vicki Wheelock, who is our hero um, and amazing, as it is uh, written on my slide, um, runs the Movement Disorders Clinic. They follow over 350 families with Huntington's disease and currently um, 17 children with juvenile Huntington's disease, which is incredibly heartbreaking. Um, form that uh, kills kids, unfortunately. So we've been working for several years now on a uh, project that was funded by the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, uh, mesenchymal stem cells engineered to produce brain-derived neurotrophic factor as a potential treatment for Huntington's disease. And uh, BDNF is also called um, miracle Grow for the brain, and this would be a uh, temporary therapy designed to um, really buy the Huntington's patient uh, more time uh, to allow the neurons to remain healthy longer before progression, but it would not be a cure. Uh, we're using these cool uh, delivery cells that we also call paramedic cells, the mesenchymal stem cells. They're from the bone marrow. They have a long safety record in human trials. Um, they know how to home in on sick and dying cells. They help neurons um, increase their connectivity. And they basically uh, regulate inflammation and secrete uh, factors to keep other cells alive. And I uh, wrote a book on the genetic engineering, edited the book, and have been working on gene editing of mesenchymal stem cells for 30 years now. So getting closer to the clinic, but not quite there yet. So the reason I love these cells so much is that they um, communicate with target cells, uh, not only by producing growth factors that get, then get taken up by the target cells, such as the neurons, um, then get taken up by their receptors, but also they can um, directly interact with other cells through these tunneling nanotubules. It's like there's a gas hose from the paramedic cell into the sick and injured cell. They pour everything into it out of their own cytoplasm out of their own uh, insides, including mitochondria, which are the cell batteries. And they um, share a lot of things, and they also send out these little uh, care packages to the sick and dying cells. And we've been funded for the last four years from um, the National Institutes of Health through one of their um, common fund uh, transformative grants to um, study this and figure out how they know which are the sick cells. So unfortunately, this um, video does not play as hard as we, as hard as we tried. But um, you can see in the top, there's that red mesenchymal stem cell. It's kind of facing this way. It looks like a chicken or something with a green eye. It is actually pouring these care packages, red care packages, into that damaged green target cell. We don't know how that mesenchymal stem cell knows that that target cell is damaged, but it knows. They basically, all of the MSCs in the video, and I, I sure wish it would play, but they all ignore all of the healthy bright green cells and that one sick little cell. They all go up to swarm around it and start infusing it with things in their paramedic function. So we love to study these cells, watch these cells, and also to understand at the molecular level, how are they finding the damaged tissue and knowing what to do to help it. We've published the uh, results of our preclinical IND enabling studies for the MSC BDNF project and uh, in the prestigious uh, journal Molecular Therapy and are now um, right where there is that little oval uh, gap. Uh, don't know if I can point to it. No, not really. Um, so we've been uh, funded by CERM. We went through the pre-IND meeting with the uh, Food and Drug Administration. And now we are uh, pending some large animal studies before we go forward with the clinical trial. But meanwhile, we have this amazing 
Juvenile Huntington's Disease Gene Editing Team that's led by uh, Dr. Kyle Fink, who is a postdoctoral fellow in my lab uh, for the last few years and is just being promoted to assistant uh, faculty member, assistant professor at UC Davis, so we're keeping him, yay. We've, uh, Kyle's team has been funded by um, We Have a Face, and we have James Valvano from We Have a Face here with us today. Uh, from, yay, in the cheering section. <laughs> also help for HD, um, Team KJ, and the Dake Foundation. Really, uh, this is the spirit of um, people who care about the disease, philanthropic donors getting together and making a difference on the impact of the outcome of the disease. Because the only other funding that we have for Kyle right now, because he's so junior, are just um, a couple of training fellowships. And we uh, appreciate that support so much. He's doing some pretty neat stuff. He's doing gene editing and gene uh, modification, hoping to send the gene editing cargo into the neurons using those mesenchymal stem cells, those delivery vehicles. And so on the top, you can see the standard um, gene therapy. We would use some kind of vector and put it in there. Um, instead, we're using these paramedic cells to bring in the cargo, to either cut out the gene and um, fix it, or to turn it on or off. And in this case, we will, would want to turn off just the mutant Huntington uh, gene and the protein that it makes. Cal has been using uh, transcription activator-like effectors called uh, TALS. They go around the DNA and bind the specific sequence that they want to um, shut down. And we can, uh, he, not we, his awesome team can make them in, they can uh, engineer the mesenchymal stem cells to make these um, proteins that are needed and can add the uh, targeting cargo into the MSCs to get into the neuron. And so we're very excited about that work. When these are delivered into the striatum of the mice, a, a juvenile Huntington's disease mouse model, we're getting good um, spread. And he can see the red bars are the knockdown of just the mutant allele and we can see that it, he's getting significant knockdown in the striatal neurons and uh, also in the cortical neurons. So he has published, his team has published um, one paper on this. They have several more pending, and uh, this research is so exciting to me because it has the potential to go in and actually change the neural stem cells that are directly within the brain. And so we're very, very excited about that. So they've shown a uh, potent mutant uh, juvenile Huntington's disease gene knockdown, both in vitro and in vivo. And I say JHD gene because they are targeting these um, cells from the, the children with um, juvenile HD that have extra long repeats and trying to shut that protein down. We'll be doing dose finding studies in the future, um, studies in parallel with behavior to measure the duration of the TALs in vivo and then the phenotypic rescue of the mice and um, we have everything in place to do this through our previous MSC uh, BDNF studies. And uh, we'll do a rule out toxicity study in the future and then um, hopefully approach the FDA. We're very lucky to have our UC Davis Good Manufacturing Practice facility. This is a clean room facility where we can manufacture the cells to um, treat the patients. And we're making several MSC products already in that facility. This takes a lot of teamwork, and I'm very grateful to everyone uh, who works with me. We have a huge uh, HD team, collaborators around the world that have been very focused on um, helping us and getting this platform forward. I really want to thank HD patient advocates, patients, and families. Many are here today, uh, special friends of ours. And um, finally, um, Please follow me on Twitter. I put any of the updates there. I just love uh, Twitter for a platform for getting the news out about regenerative medicine. I think that as scientists, we need to share a little bit more with, with the public what's going on. And so that's all I have. And with that, I would like to bring up um, the amazing James Valvano from We Have a Face. He has made an incredible movie that uh, brings me to tears every time I watch it. And uh, he's a, also a good friend. Love you very much. Uh, come on up. <laughs> I'm not sure if I know how to work it. 
You don't have to do anything with slides. They're going to okay, start awesome. your slides when you're ready. Just okay. give them the cue. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Is it on? Hello. Oh, can, can everyone hear me? There we go. I am so pleased to be here today. This is the very first time that I've ever taken part in a World STEM Summit. And I'm looking out here, and I see Francis Sildana, who I've admired for so long, with HD Care in California, her husband David, and not missing out on you, Mr. Daniel Medina. You guys have been an awesome ally to We Have a Face, and I totally appreciate everything you guys have ever done. In the front row is a very small portion of my team. In 2009, we began as a very small group of people via Skype who've never met each other. And our goal was simple, yet astronomical, to come together as patient advocates and create a film the first of its kind. How were we going to get the public's attention? Well, we needed to shake it up. And we needed to show the world exactly what Huntington's disease and juvenile Huntington's disease truly is. To remove the masks that many of us within our community have been wearing for far too long. And what I would like to do first is run the trailer now what you'll see, this is the trailer that, I think it was the 15th trailer, but the film is already out. And after the trailer, I'll go into more detail. I worry all the time about who is going to help me as my illness progresses, and I start doing less. The time that concerns me is who will feed me, bathe me, and change me. It's scary because I see one of my uncles in his bed fighting for his life. And this is a very stressful time. They need to tell the truth and not ignore the rate of suicide with HD because they are scared or because it is taboo. I have a husband who loves me and, and granddaughters who rely on me every single day. I love them so very much. Honestly, Having a child with a diagnosis of juvenile Huntington's disease is like living in a nightmare that you can't wake up from. So my symptoms got really bad. It affected my job as a special ed teacher who had to move out of our very nice house. But it was very difficult for me. Just a problem that every HD family faces. They might not want to talk about it, but it's, it's there. As a mom, you just want to protect your child from everything, including this devil's disease. And I know ultimately, this is her decision to be tested. The last straw was the night he came home drunk. He attacked me while I was holding Jennifer. That was when I finally made the decision to divorce my husband, James. If you add in the number of people who have not been diagnosed because they don't have chorea, this is potentially no longer a rare disease. So much has happened. But now, the disease progressed so quickly, and now John is here in our home on hospice. He will never leave his bed ever again. Till this very day, we do not know how many Blacks were misdiagnosed. Um. Every time I see it, it has a major effect on me because within that trailer, within less than a year, we lost two of the individuals to this disease. Miss Mary Etta Robertson's um, husband, Paul. And just recently on July 17th, my birthday of this past year, my brother passed away. Um, what you saw, is a horror movie. This disease is an absolute horror movie. And we had to be the one to bring it forward. Huntington's disease is not a one-size-fits-all disease. It is not just about the movement known as Korea. It is about the psychiatric, the cognitive, the emotional, 
the financial burdens, the abuse, drugs, inappropriate sexuality. The list goes on. So if we had a bowl here in front of us, the size of this room, and you threw Alzheimer's disease, MS, schizophrenia, depression, keep going, all of the neurologicals, welcome to Huntington's disease, because that is what this disease is. It tears the lives of everyone connected completely apart. So it was the goal that we had, and we finally released that film last year with a budget of $7,000, and it has reached almost 26 countries. It's even been played in Russia. I have no idea how that happened, but it did. And slowly but surely, people started to realize that sometimes you have to tell the truth, and sometimes be careful what you wish for, because the truth is sometimes the hardest thing to accept. And we're losing way too many people on a daily basis. Now today, I was interviewed. I had no idea what I was going to discuss today. I actually, I didn't. And two wonderful men asked me to be in front of the camera, which is not the place I enjoy to be. And they asked me a few questions. But the one question that made me step back and ask them, if you really want this person's opinion, be careful. And they asked me, why do you think regenerative medicine isn't where it needs to be? Don't ask me that question. In America, I'm very proud to be a citizen of this country. But until we put regenerative medicine first, every single disease will continue to destroy our people, Huntington's, name it. We're all here at a stem cell summit. And until that disease personally knocks on the funder's door, that's what you hear, silence. We need to step it up in our politics, we need to step it up because people are dying. I have faith in regenerative medicine. And that is where my opinion and the opinion of wehaveafaith.org global hubs stands. A lot of things right now are Band-Aids. Medications I'm on, but yes, they help. But I want a treatment, a viable treatment or a cure. And I'm so proud to stand up here with these two wonderful women. And I have faith that in 2017, this will happen. Yes. Now I have another, this is very personal to me. And I would like to um, just preface it by saying, since 2009, all I've ever wanted was to visit UC Davis Institute for Regenerative Cures. I wanted to be within the lab I wanted to see it for myself. I wanted to feel the gravity. I didn't want to just look at photos anymore. I wanted to come in, and thanks to Dr. Jan Nolta, who never says no to me, <laughs> says, sure, come on to California. Well, that's easy. I love California. So this is a little personal short video that I put together that I brought home with me. And this video alone has over 28,000 views in its first month. For the Huntington's community, that's huge. Now, how long ago was that? That was a little while ago. So the stats are outdated. But the bottom line is, this is from my heart for the first time that I actually had an experience of this kind. I have waited so very long to spend the day with Dr. Jan Nolta at UC Davis Institute for Regenerative Cures. Dr. Nolta is one of the most incredible people I've ever met. First, she is a human being. Secondly, she is a researcher. The time that I spent with Dr. Nolta is time that I will never forget and always cherish. This is where Jan does her magic. <laughs> this is where I spend a lot of time. Uh, you can tell I love the ocean and I love my HD people who are in here with me every day. And 
We have our JSD kids in the conference room across the hall. And uh, love it in here. Got my fish. And uh, do a lot of writing in here, a lot of meetings with students. And just try to pretend that I'm at the beach. There you go. Or at Greece. Or at Greece. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Okay. This is a gradient of colors. Um, you can label the cells with these different colors, and then these machines in here will tell you what proteins um, were on the surface of the stem cell based on whether they have the purple color on them or the orange color, or red or green. So we love our rainbows. Awesome. <laughs> okay, it's a cell sorter. That's actually putting stem cells into one tube and other cells into another tube. And we don't get to run that when it's like the Starship Enterprise. We have a specialized technician that does uh, that for us. Uh, this one's really good too. All the, different, all the different colors that are available. It's wonderful to have these tools for science these days. This is where we grow the cells for the Huntington's Disease Project. And the paramedic cells are in these incubators. We'll open it very gently. And they grow in these flasks um, with some media. You can see the red media there. That's their food. And um, it's like little aquariums, and they're moving around and uh, moving very slowly around in there and talking to each other and just having their own little life inside, <laughs> inside the incubator. So, this is our um, cryostat, and it takes the slices of the brain so that we can show that our therapy has preserved the striatal volume in the mice after we administer our uh, paramedic cells into the brain. And you turn this wheel, and it slices very thin shavings off of the off of the brain um, that's frozen, and puts them onto a slide so that we can stain them and see the whole uh, architecture of the brain. This is a very cool Keyens microscope. So after we get the slices of the brain uh, using the cryostat of the frozen brain, we put them on the slides, we stain them. We uh, can come here. This microscope is this is the newfangled uh, Japanese technology. It will take a very high resolution picture of the entire brain, and then we can drill down to a single neuron, so with very high resolution. And so it's very exciting to be able to have something like that. Anymore. These are our mice, and they're actually juvenile Huntington's disease mice. Um, we put, they're the yak mice, we put the uh, mesenchymal stem cells, the paramedic cells in their brains. And this is uh, imaging on living mice. So the purple color is where the MSCs are. And we can see how long they stay in the brain. And we just look at the mouse, we just image it uh, through its fur, and we don't hurt the mouse, just look at it and see how many cells are there on any given day. And that's called um, IVIS, um, In Vivo Imaging System. Awesome. Yeah, and this paper is just coming out, we'll be able to announce it in the next week, hopefully. Awesome. <laughs> it's a result of our sort of funded work. Awesome. Yeah. As a person with Huntington's disease, this visit meant more to me than anything else. It's different when you see pictures, videos, all over the internet, but to actually be in front of all of the machines, it was surreal. This visit with Dr. Nolta really made an impact on my life. I truly know that they are working in this lab to cure juvenile Huntington's disease and Huntington's disease, and I have faith that that's exactly what's going to happen. You remember that day? <laughs> that, that very weekend was when we premiered the film at UC Davis, and it was absolutely brilliant because I was able to meet Dr. Vicki Wheelock for the very first time, and so many others that um, we only saw each other on Skype. I, I have faith that 2017 is going to be uh, a big year, and I give my vow as the president and founder of WeHaveAFace.org Global Hubs that we are going to make noise louder than we have ever had because we have to do what the AIDS community did. We have to step up our game, we have to scream, we have to yell, we have to make sure no door is left ajar. We have to just bash it down. So I give you and Leslie Anything that we have a face.org can do to help you guys, we are here. And um, I have faith that 2017 is going to be our year. I thank you all so much, and as we say it, we have a face. You are loved.
That was great. It always brings me to tears. Next, we have the incredible uh, Dr. Leslie Thompson. She's well known to the Huntington's community. She's been working to try to make a difference for Huntington's patients for many years, and she has some astounding data to share with us. Leslie. Thank you very much, and James, that was amazing. Um, very moving. Um, okay. Tough one to follow. <laughs> but we are all, all of the HD community of researchers are extremely committed to trying to find ways to treat this disease. And we have quite a bit of hope for stem cell um, approaches. So as you've heard, it really is a race against time. We have adult onset HD, juvenile onset HD. And I'll go through a little bit about the disease itself very, very quickly, because you've heard a lot about it. Um, so it was first described by George Huntington in the 1800s, and he had this incredible description of the disease where uh, it was deemed as a fairly rare disease, although as you've heard, it's really much more common than we first thought, and it's genetic. So the in, it's autosomal dominant, so individuals who have the disease, their children are 50% at risk of inheriting it. Um, typically, it strikes in midlife, but it can occur very early, even down to somebody who's two years of age. And it, it lasts for quite a while. It, it impacts a person for 10 to 20 years in their families. And often it's been characterized by the chorea, these movements, but as you just heard, it's also uh, characterized by cognitive deficits, psychiatric symptoms, and, and other manifestations. And this is an individual with adult onset Huntington's disease at the Mass General Clinic. And you can see sort of these very characteristic movements that occur, difficulty in walking, in, in um, directing their movements. And this is an individual in Venezuela. There's a large group of, of subjects and patients in, in Venezuela who helped actually in the search for the disease gene back in 1993. And you can see the the general movements and the wasting that starts to occur in the disease as well. Um, this is a very characteristic feature of the disease end stage Huntington's. It's really, as you heard, just an absolutely devastating disease. And uh, it also comes on gradually. So the symptoms, initial symptoms are um, oftentimes the cognitive, the inability to perform daily tasks, and that progresses over time with additional psychiatric symptoms and then the movement. And what we'd really like to do is find, is this pointer work? Does that work for you? Okay. Um, what we'd like to find are things that, that occur very early in the disease, so in that what's called prodromal pre-manifest stage, before disease symptoms are obvious, is when we really would like to treat the disease. So it's genetically programmed to generation of nerve cells, and this is a cross-section from a brain uh, from an unaffected individual and one who died from Huntington's disease. And I can't use the pointer here, but you can see there's this enlargement of those spaces, and there's the region that's primarily affected are the medium spiny GABAergic um, neurons in the striatum. So this region of the brain called the striatum is what's most overtly or noticeably affected in the disease. And as I'll show you, that's the area we've been targeting with the studies we've been doing. And there's also, but there's, it's a brain-wide disease. It affects a lot of regions of the brain. And this is actually one of the reasons why I think this type of approach might be so effective because the brain is so complex. So many areas of the brain are affected that this really goes above and beyond a single drug, what a single drug could do to treat the disease. So the mutation itself, it's present in the DNA. This is a CAG repeat. It's a repeating unit of DNA that repeats over and over and over again and expands in an individual with HD. And that's manifested within the protein that course, that's made from the DNA and it expands to what are called this poly-Q tract or polyglutamine tract. So it's a repeating amino acid piece of the protein that, that expands beyond normal range. And when you have a below 34 of these repeats in a row, an individual that all of us have this gene, we all have this, these repeats, that's an unaffected individual. But 40 and above, an individual will get the disease. Above about 60, you got to start getting into the juvenile onset range, and the larger the repeat, generally, the younger the age of onset. 
So, um, as I mentioned, there is this juvenile onset. I just showed the inspiration. One of the major inspirations for us is Frances Saldana and her family, who's here. She really has been our partner throughout all of our work. And uh, she has these wonderful children who um, I actually have a picture of them in my office. And all three of them, her, their father died of Huntington's, and all three of them um, had the disease. Two of the girl, both daughters have passed away, and Michael is in final stages of the disease. So there's a really urgent need for all this, and it's typically the juvenile form is inherited from the father. So the presence of this mutant pro protein causes hugely broad effects throughout a cell in the brain, within neurons in the brain and other cell types. It's, I'm not going to go into the details, but you can see this sort of complex map and almost every process we've looked at over the years since the gene was identified is impacted in the disease. You have the, the shuttling of proteins within the cell, the ability to make energy, the ability to make proteins that are specific to take care of a neuron, to make it healthy. All of these processes are affected. You accumulate clumps of abnormal protein, of mutant protein in the brain. And so we'd like to really get at this as early as we can, it's, it's almost like there's this continuous flow of damage and we want to intervene and that's where the stem cell treatment transplantations come in. So we asked whether, we and Jan and others have asked whether we could use a stem cell um, transplantation approach to intervene. And the idea with this is that typically in a healthy brain, you have these connections between neurons that communicate with each other and they're, they're healthy axons, they're healthy um, electrical signals that occur. But in HD, those signals are disrupted and over time the connections become broken. And what we, our goal with the stem cells is that we'd like to provide neurotrophic protection. So we'd like to help those cells and help those connections maintain their health for as long as possible. So we're not trying to replace any cells in that tissue. We're just trying to make sure that the cells that are there survive better and are healthier. So that was the goal of, of the studies. And we've been using a cell type called a neural stem cell. And in this case, um, as you heard from Dr. Nolta, she's been using the mesenchymal stem cells that, uh, that can form various neural cell types. And in this case, we're using pluripotent ES-derived neural stem cells. So these can um, differentiate and go into populations of neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, multiple different types of brain cells when they um, differentiate along this lineage. So we've started with that population of NSCs and transplanted those into the brain. And just the bottom line is they have a very significant improvement on this transplantation on um, deficits in the HD mouse models that we've tested. So we've tested now three different models. One is um, called R62, and this is just expresses a piece. So when, when Huntington, when the protein itself is made, the mutant protein starts to get clipped. It's a huge protein and starts to get clipped into littler pieces that are very, very toxic. So the first one we did is to use a mouse that expresses just this piece that gets the mice very, very sick very quickly. And uh, so we can assess some of our treatments rapidly in this mod model. And so the cells are injected into the striatum, the region that I mentioned is most profoundly affected, uh, and 100,000 cells per hemisphere. And, and then we've been assessing um, over time various readouts. So the mice, all of these mice have effects on transcription and the ability to produce RNAs and proteins. They have motor deficits, similar to patients. They form this aberrant accumulation of, of junk, of, of um, clumps of protein in the brain. They get sick early, they have weight loss, early death, and they have this disruption of these electrical signals or synaptic um, deficits in the brain. Then more recently, as I'll show you, we've gone on to use what's called a Q140 mouse, and this is when the mutation was put into the normal mouse genome. So it's a full-length Huntington protein within its normal um, chromo chromosomal environment or DNA environment. And that's much more slowly progressing, but it, it mimics somewhat the, the, what the human disease is like, rather than putting in an extra piece of the protein. 
and then another one that has a longer repeat. So all of these have expanded repeats within the juvenile onset range, all of these mice. And again, this is also a team effort funded by CIRM and uh, the group in my lab run by Jack Reedling, who's a project scientist, and Gerhard Bauer at the GMP facility at UC Davis, to whom we are very grateful for all their wonderful work, and Mike Levine and Marie-Francoise Chasselet at UCLA, who are um, long-standing HD researchers as well. And we have a number of different consultants who help us, such as Ray Dorsey and Sarah Tabrizi and, and individuals who've worked on the clinical aspects of HD for many years. Okay, so to give an example, um, we focused more recently on just using these uh, ES, uh, the ESC-derived NSCs, and these ES lines were from a company called Biotime, who's represented here at this meeting, and these are just absolutely beautiful cells. They, um, we've been following their karyotype over time. We're, we do a lot of quality control of the cells, or I should say Davis does a lot of quality control of the cells inject them into the um, bilaterally into the two hemispheres. And what we find is that they actually stay fairly contained within where you inject them. They kind of stay as a little pocket of cells within the brain. Don't seem to migrate quite a bit uh, into other areas. And we test behavior, and after about four to five weeks, and this is in the short-term model, harvest the tissue and analyze that tissue. So first of all, they're starting to see, we see that they differentiate, so they start to go down these neural lineage paths. Uh, most of them become, in the short-term model over this four-week period, become what are called double cortin labeled cells, so they become immature neurons. But they start to take on some of the characteristics of more mature neurons um, shown in the, on the right. So they're on that path, they're on the right path to becoming neurons within the brain and they don't become other cell types like oligodendrocytes. Um, so that was very reassuring. We had tried three different ES-based lines, um, NSCs, and in each case, uh, some of them were ruled out because they were prone to karyotype abnormalities, but in each case, they had an effect on behavior. So in three independent cell lines, three different sets of experiments, they had an effect. And this just shows an example of um, the effect after implantation, again, I can't use the, you, you don't have a pointer back there, right? Um, oh, thank you. Oh, that helps. There we go. Thank you. should have asked earlier. Uh, so what we find is this clasping deficit. So HD mice, normal mice, when you ha hang them by the tail, they just sort of hang there and have their arms splayed out and legs. But an HD mouse tends to reach back up and grasp its abdomen. And all the stem cell treatments reduce that propensity to clasp. So this is a clasping animals, reduction, and they are de either delayed or um, in some case about 50% of the mice don't ever clasp. So they, in each case of the stem cell treatments, that, that phenotype is um, helped. And a number of other motor behaviors are improved, just showing one here. Where, uh, called a pole test, where mice can scamper down. They like to just scoot down the pole very quickly, but an HD mouse, and I'll show you a video of this, has an impaired ability to do that. They kind of start sliding down the, the pole slowly, and they take a longer period of time. So this is an R62 vehicle-treated mouse here and the length of time it takes, and following transplantation, and this is all with the biotime cells, they have a reduced time that it takes to go down the um, pole. Now oh, this isn't working, I'm jinxed. All right, and then other behaviors such as the ability to pull, to, to grip onto a mesh, this both measures their muscle um, weakness and also just sort of motivation and other things. And a rotor rod, the ability to stay on this rotating little treadmill is improved as well. One of the things that um, we found is we're starting to look at mechanism, and there's a couple of things that have come up which we're trying to now investigate much more deeply, is that BDNF is produced by these cells. You heard about this from Jan, where they've engineered the cells, MSCs, to produce BDNF, and these cells tend to, as they differentiate in the tissue, they um, produce BDNF. So here's untreated uh, cells, so there's, you just see this background of staining, 
And when you have the transplanted cells, those red dots represent BDNF that's produced by the transplanted cells. And so there's a possible role for this and other growth factors. It's not just BDNF. Uh, and it may even contribute to things like endogenous neurogenesis, so the production of neur neurons within the brain itself. And this differentiation in the brain is required for the production of BDNF. So if you um, just have the cells and culture, the NSCs, they don't produce it. But once they start to differentiate into these populations, the gray bar on the right, they start to produce, even in a plate, in a tissue culture plate, they start to produce BDNF. And what was really astounding to us, though, Mike Levine did experiments at UCLA to look at electrophysiology, so this ability to have electrical currents um, produced from and, and from the stem cells themselves. And this really allows us individuals to have the ability to think, to do tasks, so this cognitive impairment we see, for instance. And just ignore all the graphs, but the bottom line from these experiments is that, first of all, the NSCs um, themselves seem to act like immature neurons and can um, transmit electrical currents themselves. And, and they receive inputs from other cells, either neighboring cells or other transplanted cells. And they normalize some of the aberrant currents that occur in the HD mice, so some of the deficits that occur in the mice they attempt to rescue, which was really a surprise to us. Went on to this longer term model that Marie-Francois Chesley had developed and find that, that a number of things are improved in those mice. One is um, cognition, so the ability to recognize, say, a novel object and prefer to explore and find that object. They have a significant improvement. If you look at the black on the left and the gray, on, so if you see the far left black, that's normal um, object recognition. Second one is way down, and the third one is the transplantation mice, and that's back up to almost wild type levels at that age. They also have the ability to stay on this little running wheel. This is a very characteristic behavior of these mice. You test them at night for two weeks on these running wheels, and they both learn to use it, and they can stay on it for much longer periods of time, very re reaching about halfway up to normal mice, to unaffected mice. So this was also very exciting and promising. Um, also found in these mice that the aberrant inflammation that occurs in the HD mice is reduced significantly by this treatment, which um, has great promise. We, we know that inflammation is probably contributing quite a bit to some of the symptoms of, of HD. And one concern is that when you have these transplanted cells, they might acquire HD phenotypes. We know from some of the fetal cell transplant work that occasionally you will have a, a transplanted cell that acquires an aggregate or clumps of protein or becomes sick in the case of Parkinson's disease. But at least over the time frame that we've looked in all these animals, we haven't seen that. These cells do not um, acquire aggregates within them. So that was also good news for this. Now we have to see what happens in larger animals, of course, and, and in people, but at least at this stage. And one of the tests that we've seen over the years in other work, one criteria is that there's a lot of proteins that accumulate abnormally in an HD brain, including uh, mutant Huntington. And this is be partially, at least, because the cells no longer retain the ability to clear out the trash. So they just accumulate like trash in the brain. And what we've seen as a measure of this, we've used as a measure, we've found that there's specific forms of, the, of this protein that represents, that correlates very well with when the mice get sick or, the, or correlate with mice being sick. And this is shown here from a Huntington's disease um, postmortem tissue, and this is repeated over many different tissues. But on the left, you see an unaffected uh, cell lysate, so these are proteins harvested from an HD brain, uh, striatum, and on the right, in an HD. And you can see the smear, if you can see that smear at the top of the gel, that represents these starting to aggregate proteins. They're not big clumps, but they're high molecular weight and soluble species. So they they represent a form that seems to be fairly toxic in the brain. And in one of our other studies, um, we had reduced, this was another molecule that we had reduced through viral uh, expression of a, 
of an RNAi, so a molecule that reduces expression of this protein called pias. And what we found is in this particular study is, and this is showing the poll test I talked about, if you looked on the left, that's untreated mice, and on the right is treated with this particular molecule. And you can see the HD mice take a long time. The ones on the right look just like wild type. So they're the exact same um, phenotype. They're completely rescued. And, but what that, what's critical for that is this reduction on the right in the box of these aggregating species, of this, this type of Huntington accumulation that seems to be deleterious, and that's correspondingly reduced. So it was really exciting when we saw the same thing in the NSC treatments. So with the stem cell treatments, uh, you see the smear in the HDR62 mice in the middle vehicle treated, and it's pretty much gone. So it's Huntington um, accumulation on the right. And when you look at ubiquitin, which tends to co-aggregate and co-localize with these, you also see this significant reduction on the right. So it's corresponding to something that we know we would want to see when we, when we have rescue in a, in a mouse model. Also see uh, decreases in inclusion formation in both mouse models, in the R62 and in the long-term mice. Uh, and they're significantly reduced in both models. On the right, you can hopefully see that there's less of these dots. And finally, we've now gone into the second um, long-term mouse, Q175 mouse, and we've perfected a lot of, or improved a lot of the, the um, immunosuppression paradigms. Since these are human cells, the mice have to be immunosuppressed. And we're now seeing extensive um, survival of the cells, initial ones were around 41% or so, and these are much, much higher. Uh, and they've survived over a period of eight months now over time. And they have begun, because they're there for longer, they've differentiated further along the neural pathway. And in many cases, they're no longer NSCs, they're no longer nest and positive. But you start to see um, MAP2 staining and new N staining representing more and more mature neurons. So they're differentiating over that path and surviving in the brain. And we're just analyzing the behavioral data now and um, hoping that that's going to be positive as well. So these really are exciting and often offer some potential for treatment options for HD. And we're now in the stages of finishing the, this third study. And I should mention that many of these studies have been replicated. We've done them three or four times with different cohorts of mice. Um, we're finishing this early testing, and we're also testing the stem cells when you give them to the mice when they're already sick. So we're testing whether somebody might benefit from symptomatic treatment. Um, expanding cell banks and working closely with the FDA to, um, we're about to go to, soon, to our pre-IND meeting and looking at dosages, but really safety. Safety is our absolute key criteria here, trying to make sure that these cells don't develop into any kind of tumors or have any deleterious effects, and sort of refining the ways that we'll um, use surgical intervention and devices in the future. And so it's really an exciting time. It's a path, as we've heard a lot about in this meeting, and with the goal of trying to rid ourselves of this horrible disease, or at least make things a lot better. And this is the team at UCI. It's uh, several groups of us that work very closely together, um, and other individuals not shown here. And in particularly, thanks to the HD families, these are two of the first individuals we um, got IP fibro skin cells biopsies from for our IPS work. Um, Marie, uh, Francis's daughter, and Emily, who died at age 21 of juvenile Hunts Huntington's. But their cells are in the lab. And of course, CIRM, none of this would have happened from our very first grant in 2008 till now. None of this would have happened without CIRM funding and the vision of Bob Klein and the state of California. And just um, also want to thank the many organizations. For instance, HD Care has really made a difference for us and helped fund uh, a lot of this work along with other organizations, CIRM and NIH as well, and our collaborators. So thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much.
gives us all hope. And uh, do we have any questions? We have just a couple minutes before the session's over. Otherwise, you can, yeah, please. Uh, this is for Leslie. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the process you go through with the FDA? Sure. So, it's, yeah, it's on now. Uh, we had what's called a pre-pre-IND meeting where we discussed with them the types of preclinical studies we would need to do in the mice and the next step, and they gave us some advice of how we would package what's called a pre-IND. PIND is where you work with the FDA on what are the key IND enabling activities. So before you can go into a phase one clinical trial, you have to have what's called an IND, investigational new, what's it? New drug, yes. Um, and, and some of the guidelines are now being altered that we heard about actually this morning, some of the things for biologics. And Jan probably can address this even better than I can. But they, they help you um, with what dosing studies, what safety studies, all the different, you know, what devices, exactly how are you going to inject these cells into the brain? Exactly what piece of, you know, equipment are you going to use? What type of neurosurgery? What type, every single detail that's going to go into the human trial is, is um, defined during that time. You, t you define what the, what, how you're going to look at the tissues to make sure that everything was very, very safe. You go to, uh, organizations uh, that do what's called good laboratory practice analysis of the tissue. So there's this whole set of studies that have to be done, and the FDA helps guide those. And you, I don't know if you have other comments. Thank you. Yeah, we do, um, we do good laboratory practice, and it, it's a way of keeping the record so that when the FDA comes to audit, they'll very cleanly see everything that they need to see. And that's what you need to go into the IND, the investigational new drug, which is the next step after the pre-IND. I want to comment, just I don't think I did. So Jan, the, Jan's the GMP facility at UC Davis where the cells are grown we're using, those actually could go into patients. Those are under standards of good manufacturing yeah. practice, yeah. Great, thank you. Yes. Okay, I guess this is for Jan. Yes. Uh, so you're, you're doing research on juvenile HD as well as adult uh, HD. So I really don't understand the difference. And when we have a treatment, will it be different for juvenile onset uh, versus adult onset? It's a good question. Um, Kyle's team has started with the juvenile Huntington's disease uh, cell lines and is working with those and targeting um, those alleles because he's working at the molecular level. And they have the very long repeats. And it could be different for adult, H on, adult onset HD. Um, we think that the strategies that he's using would also be applicable to adult HD, but he's really starting with the juvenile HD mice models and the juvenile HD cell lines. Okay. So we, we just want to, nobody, nobody is, as far as I know, is doing research to help the kids. Um, the juvenile HD population has just been yeah. forgotten for a very long time, right, right. and that's really what's, what's in Kyle's heart and his team's heart. Okay. Can I add to that just for yeah, a second, please. though? Um, is, is, so that's, that's correct that in terms of that treatment, but I just want to make the note that all the research in the HD field really has been looking at juvenile range repeats because the reason is you have to use these very long repeats. So every mouse model I talked about is juvenile range mm -hmm. repeats because you can't get a symptom in a mouse with 45 repeats, whereas you can with 100 repeats. And the same with the IPS lines, you tend to look at the juvenile onset lengths first because they have symptoms in a dish, and then you go back and compare to the adult onset ranges. And as Jan mentioned, I think that things that we find in one will inform the other, and they'll, it, but it's a spectrum. It's a range of repeats, right? There's not like this finite cutoff of what defines one or the other. Okay, thank you. And I do have something to add for, um, for James. Um, you know, I really love your energy, and I feel the same kind of energy as far as <coughs> wanting to blast it out to the world about Huntington's, getting all the families out there to talk about it. But what I have found is that families don't want to talk about it. They still want to hide. And I think what we have to do is we really have to be on top of the developments and research so that, to inspire them. Otherwise, you're going to keep hiding, and we'll never know how many people there really are out there. So I think that the, the leadership and the different HD organizations have to, have to come together 
to build a strategy on how we're going to do this. It's going to have to be the, the best of the stakeholders and, you know, hit the media as a group together. You know, uh, we have a face, uh, HD Care, uh, uh, Help for HD International, etc., HDSA. We haven't done that yet. And that's the only way we're going to get attention. That's the only way that the AIDS community got attention and went forward to the FDA, actually bombarded the FDA offices, got in every media station. That's what we have to do. So I think we need to get together to form some kind of a strategic plan to do this. Otherwise, we'll just keep talking and talking and never get the support that we need to finally end this. Absolutely. Am I on? Thank you very yeah, much. I was, Am I, I was, on? I was wondering, uh, I, there are two, two areas. One, you, you emphasized about the accumulation of uh, pro abnormal proteins in, in, the, in the brain. And then the, the second thing is I was uh, hoping you would have discussed something about uh, the gene technology, whether it's uh, CRISP or short hair RNA uh, to knock out the abnormal gene mutations. Oh, that one's for you. <laughs> So the first one, um, our, our gene editing team is using CRISPR um, for the gene, the, taking out certain areas, but the TALs allow a um, shutdown when they're complex with a crab domain, uh, allow a shutdown of that uh, allele selectively, so the TALs are a little more flexible for us and for our delivery system. And I think the protein accumulation question. Yeah, the protein accumulation, what was the question? Well, I, well, I, I was just... And uh, to incorporate that as a method to um, get rid of these uh, abnormal uh, proteins or misfolded proteins. Yeah. yeah, and so we've been looking, we think inflammation obviously has a, a role in clearance, especially early on. That may be why it's elevated initially and it helps clear out this, but then it comes to a point where it can't clear it anymore and they start to accumulate, but we're, we're looking at what happens with the inflammatory response and going to look at infiltration of T-cells T and things. We're, that, those are pending experiments. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank we'll you. need to end this session now. We're a few minutes over, but thank you all for being here so much, and thank you to our families and our advocates for your passion. <laughs> <laughs>